I see we have people from all over North America. Uh, uh, that's wonderful. We've also got uh, people from British Isles, from Europe, from Russia, um, from uh, Mexico, Costa Rica. So welcome to everyone. That's the beauty of this technology, being able to extend our reach, which is exactly what I want to talk to you about today, um, about being able to extend our reach and uh, specifically, uh, I'm delighted to be able to share uh, with you uh, the model of attachment that came together for me after many years of trying to put the pieces together. It came together about 20 years ago. It's continued to develop. It, uh, I still get surprised by it. It teaches me things sometimes. I, I say, oh my goodness, I never saw this. Uh, a model is always evaluated by its power to explain you can't research a model directly. Uh, you can only see if there's any information that's inconsistent to it and how powerful it is it is in explaining phenomena. And so hopefully this uh, this model helps to make sense of um, of the dynamics in your life, of those around you, uh, the people you love, uh, that uh, this uh, this helps make sense of this. The subtitle, Developing the Capacity to Hold On, one part. This is the idea about increasing our reach. Of course, is uh, is is what uh, what attachment is all about. Also, the ability to hold on through emotional storms uh, that is highly is significant, as well as the ability to uh, to hold on as uh, as uh, as one becomes one's own person. Uh, and so this all requires a development. We're not born with that capacity for a relationship that has to be developed. And uh, so hopefully this makes sense. My faculty uh, challenged me uh, to do uh, an, a, a piece that could both serve as an intro uh, for those fresh to the perspective, that could also serve as a reference piece for those who have been introduced just briefly and a course uh, or on YouTube or so on, and also something that could be used for those who have uh, been fairly exposed, but a way of being able to bring all of this together. So the, the challenge was, of course, I, I could do it much easier in 15 hours, which I have. I've, I've got a course called Becoming Attached, which is 15 hours. It's a lot easier for me than to do it in an hour and a half, but hopefully I can do this in an hour and a half. So fasten your seat belts. Uh, because we'll be going at a fairly good clip here, and uh, but the idea is is uh, is to get uh, the big picture because because is really what it's all about uh, the big picture. If you get the big picture, the details will gradually fill in. Uh, but this is uh, this is about uh, the the big perspective. Uh, so I I will uh, I will move right along uh, to begin. And first of all, just a, a few introductory uh, words about the the attachment, both as a word and a construct. It, it's actually a word uh, that has become commonly accepted in science uh, for the science of relationship. It's about the science of the between, between particles, between atoms, between heavenly bodies, between animals between parents and their offspring, between humans. It's, it's about the between. And so rather than about the individual itself, it's, it's about this, this relationship. But of course, the roots of that relationship have to be within the character of the individual. And so it's, uh, one must never forget that it's, it, is, uh, it is a word for the science of relationship. It's a term for the human predisposition of, of togetherness. I, as humans, we get stuck on each other. We, we group together. We cluster together. We orbit around each other. Uh, we revolve around each other. We partner up. Uh, we are very social creatures. And so it's about this. It's, it's actually the oldest theory there is, starting with Aristotle, at, at least formally. Uh, that humans are social creatures, social beings. Uh, so it is, uh, it is the oldest, in a sense, um, explanation of human behavior. 
Uh, it is the pro most profound explanation of human behavior. It's very, very difficult to put into words because it's so huge, it's so big. Uh, it's the preeminent characteristic of all things, both living and non-living. It's the first characteristic of particles. Um, atoms, again, get stuck on each other. It explains gravity, fusion, magnetism. Uh, it, uh, it, it is the essence when we look at what is the preeminent characteristic. It is all about attachment. And so, uh, it, it, again, the, the, um, the profoundness of this understanding is so big. It's so hard to put into words. It's so hard to create a model of it. And my attempt here is, is not, was not to create a model uh, for all of attachment that was equally applicable to particles as it was to humans, uh, my challenge was to be able to take all that information and create a model that was applicable to, uh, to human attachment. Uh, the scientific definition of human attachment is that drive or relationship characterized by the pursuit and preservation of proximity. Uh, actually, uh, this is the scientific definition for attachment at any level, whether it's particles, whether it's heavenly bodies, uh, uh, whether it's galaxies, uh, uh, no matter what level. It's either the drive, which means a whole family of instincts in humans, it's also emotions and so on, a whole family of instincts, impulses, motives, and emotions, or a relationship characterized by the pursuit and preservation of proximity. Uh, proximity is Latin for nearness. Uh, it's an analogy. And so if you're married, uh, you that marriage should first and foremost uh, exemplify uh, the pursuit and preservation of proximity. You want to be with each other, like each other, belong to each other, have a sense of significance to each other, love each other. All of this has to do with the pursuit and preservation of proximity, which we'll, we will unfold. If in a friendship, this should define a friendship first and foremost. If it doesn't define a friendship, if it doesn't define a marriage, uh, then there's obvious problems. Uh, if you don't want to be with each other, then there is a significant problems in this. These are issues of attachment. Again, attachment is huge and therefore the challenge to be able to put it together. Uh, thinking about huge, there, there is a particular story uh, that exists, especially in therapeutic circles, uh, a particular story ab about something profound, something huge, something very, very large, something so close to us. It's a story about uh, six blind sages and their first encounter with an elephant. And an elephant, again, stands for something absolutely huge. You can't take uh, in, in in one take. Uh, it, uh, the elephant in the room is something that is there, yet there's no words for it. It's, for. it's the most profound uh, uh, influence, yet nobody talks about it. Uh, and so it's too close uh, to put into words all of these things uh, uh, the elephant uh, speaks to or is illustrative of. Uh, or analogous to. And the story is very simple. These six blind sages are set in India. Uh, they have their uh, first encounter with an elephant, and they all encounter some aspect of the elephant, whether it's the tusk or the tail, uh, whether it's the ear. And so th the, uh, the poem that, uh, that evolves from this, the story, is they describe the elephant in completely different ways. And, of course, the truth of, of, uh, of this is that, uh, that you have to put all the pieces together to get a picture of the elephant. And, in fact, the elephant is much more than the sum of all the pieces put together. And that is the story of attachment. There have been many blind sages throughout the years, starting with Aristotle. Many blind sages. Nobody got it all. There were just pieces, pieces of it, uh, and uh, just like the elephant, the piece only really takes meaning when you see the whole. My life story, story so to speak, is to put the pieces together. Uh, so I, I struggled for 20 years trying to find out everything I could about attachment, reading all the theories and physics and chemistry about attachment, human attachment, animal attachment. 
to see if I could somehow put those pieces together into a coherent whole. So this is the story of my elephant, so to speak, of what I saw when the pieces are put together. Obviously, I'd like a very long time to talk about it. Uh, I could never stop talking about it, uh, but I'd like uh, this to be my contribution, in a sense, uh, to human understanding, to make sense of this, of the most important phenomena. Uh, of this. Uh, as I said, this model came together about 20 years ago and, and uh, has refined in terms of its nuances, but the basic pieces came together then. I'd just like to do honor to some of the blind sages. There are many of those sages. I will not take the time to go over them now. I do in my, in, uh, my uh, course on becoming attached, the 15-hour course. I won't do it now. I just want to give you a sense of these uh, uh, tremendous individuals who grasp a piece of this, Harlow. Um, uh, uh, we, we have Takio Doi, the Japanese uh, theorist, uh, Sidney Girard in terms of intimacy, yet he never mentions attachment because he didn't know that's what he was talking about. Uh, Conrad Lorenz, all the object relations people. Uh, Albert Bandura, uh, Bandura's learning theory, social learning theory, when he... Um, uh, when he retired, he said he only had one regret, that he hadn't understood that we only imitate those whom we are, are attached to, that his theory belonged in terms of attachment. Of course, the, uh, the chemistry of attachment, uh, auto rank, it could go on and on. The point is, is that John Bowlby, the person I put in the center here, who also had what we now call a classic theory of, a, of human attachment, uh, he gave a word for this to join it all together, and so he was the father of the word attachment. Attachment theories have existed for a very, very long time. There are always theories of togetherness, and they exist on every, every level. Uh, plant, uh, molecule, particle, uh, universal, at every level. And so Einstein was a, an attachment theorist. Newton was an attachment theorist. My own journey uh, is an interesting uh, journey in, in retrospect. It's said that as you become older, from Eric Erickson, that you long to put all the things together in one tapestry, so to speak, that there's some kind of integrative possibility. When I first of all started my academic career, I was absolutely fascinated by the theories of the quest for value, significance of esteem, and so on. Uh, then I became fascinated by social learning theory, about the theories of becoming like each other, uh, and then uh, self-disclosure uh, and intimacy, never knowing that I all of these were speaking to a common phenomena. I got into identity formation with the object relations theory. There was a time when I was the uh, teaching uh, seminars on, on uh, for love, to love, and in love in terms of marriage workshops. And then I got into, of course, the early attachment theories, human attachment theories, and theories with monkeys and birds, Lorenz and Harlow and so on. Again, not realizing that these were all pieces of the elephant. And so I, I, I feel completely, in a sense, satisfied in this, uh, to, to be at the age where all things are meant to come together. And every piece of the journey that I have had in the last 45 years or so comes together in this construct of attachment. So this is what I want to share with you. Again, for me, it's been a personal journey. Uh, and attachment brings all of it together. These are just pieces of the, of the puzzle. They're just pieces of the elephant, and there's so much more. Uh, so uh, what, is it, uh, uh, what is it that I've seen uh, when I've got a glimpse of the big picture, when the details did not obscure it, when uh, the, uh, the trees haven't obscured the forest, so to speak? Uh, I'll just give you, the, 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 in a sense, uh, some of the conclusions. First of all, when I put the pieces together, I found that humans have six or seven ways of attaching three of which seem uh, much more unique to humans themselves and thus very pivotal to becoming fully human and humane. Uh, even more basic than this, attachment requires a development. Uh, we start off in life uh, uh, just with a very primitive way of attaching, which we'll go through. 
Uh, it is an attachment needs to be developed. The capacity for relationship needs to be developed. It's not automatic. And so this capacity for relationship is gradually developed in six sequential phases. This completely took me by surprise. I was struggling to find the different ways they were attaching. I was categorizing. I was looking at all the examples, going over my clients, children, grandchildren, all of the phenomena and so on, seeing if it could fit into this model, only to realize that, oh my goodness, uh, that... Uh, uh, that uh, certain phases preceded others and followed others and were necessary for others. And uh, so once I sketched this out, I was able to, uh, it became rather self-evident when looking at young children and uh, the story of the unfolding of their uh, attachment. And so again, uh, the purpose also began to be re revealed that the purpose of the development of attachment is to be able to hold on, to preserve a sense of connection, a sense of, of, of contact and closeness, even when physically apart. So when you can't be with, you can still uh, feel close, and we'll explain why in a, in a bit, as well as enabling them to stay close while becoming their own persons. This is huge. Uh, as uh, I won't have time to develop here, but one of the main purposes of attachment that we'll mention just briefly is as a womb to maturation. It is the equivalent of of, of the uh, uh, the womb for the fetus. Uh, now this is the womb for the maturation, but it has to be big enough to be able to sustain individuality. So this becomes the challenge as well. Now, if conditions are ideal. Children fall into attachment. It just happens. You don't have to teach it. Uh, you, know, it, it you know, this has been happening for tens of thousands of years, ever since uh, human life began. It just unfolds. And, uh, and if, if it is, uh, conditions are ideal, each mode of attaching should emerge in each of the first six years of a child's life. One of the things that when I taught developmental psychology is I also taught art or the development of art in children. Not taught art, but the development of art. And it became clear that the art precedes the attaching, that the child is actually moving into play to get used to certain symbols. Uh, for instance, the heart we'll talk about is all of a sudden the heart it gets into the drawings or uh, children are putting things that belong together together in their yeah, usually when they're two years of age in the third year of life which precedes a certain kind of way of attaching so it all comes together everything is coherent uh, it is never too late however for attachment potential to be realized and that's the good news if conditions are conducive it will unfold in my particular story of course everyone has a story of their own attachment and the unfolding of the stages of attachment in my particular story when i realized this i realized that i was 20 years late uh, for the sixth stage of attachment uh, of course it's uh, it's harder when it's late it doesn't come without uh, some problems just like getting mumps when you're much older or uh, the measles and so on but nevertheless better late than never and so uh, you might look at your own story of attachment, your own history of the development of the capacity for relationship uh, in terms of this context as well. And so children will spontaneously fall into attachment if conditions are conducive. And by conducive, we mean here that there's an invitation to exist. You feel this invitation to exist in the presence of another. Uh, for the newborn, you look up and you see in the mother or father's eyes this, this twinkle in their eyes, the delight that you exist. Uh, this lightening up this eyes, you, 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 you feel this invitation to exist. We're all born in this world, but are we invited to, to be here in the presence of those that we're attached to? Uh, so there is a sense of, of, of this invitation, and how big is that invitation, and how consistent is that invitation, how secure is that invitation? Uh, do we feel the warmth of that invitation? Is it safe from disruption? You know, this is so important. It doesn't feel safe to attach if it sets us up for separation. 
that's one of the biggest issues in, in, in the development of attachment. If all you can see when you get close is the fact that you're, you know, you're going to face separation, that's not safe. And so foster children have great difficulty with this. Adopted children will have great difficulty with this because closeness has set them up for separation. And so that, that's not a disorder. That's only natural. It needs to be safe. And there's ways to be able to keep this safe. Many things we won't be able to go into today because all of my courses, and I have but 22 courses now, have unfolded from what I'm going to share with you today. And, but this is just the introduction. Uh, and the heart is soft, and that is a huge condition. The heart is soft. And what do we mean by the heart is soft? Well, this is intuitive language. But what we discovered is there's a difference between emotions and feelings. A big difference between emotions. All mammals have emotions. All creatures with an emotional brain or a limbic system. Uh, feelings are different. Uh, feelings are the thinking brain's interpretation of the, the, the feedback that comes from the body of how we're moved by an emotion. An emotion stirs us up. It moves us. And that feedback is now interpreted by the thinking brain, and it's what we call a feeling. It's a conscious tip of the iceberg of emotion. Feelings are optional. Uh, we don't, uh, people differ tremendously in being able to feel their emotions, especially the emotions uh, where the feelings get hurt, uh, easily hurt. Uh, and so a, f a feeling you're missing. You have to be able to feel the emptiness, attachment, whole. That's the feeling of, of missing. Uh, caring. Uh, many, many children and adults have lost their ability to feel their caring. Uh, I don't care. It doesn't matter. They, they, they don't feel this. Uh, to... Uh, there's so many of this, uh, uh, these tender feelings, and they must be felt if we are going to be fully capable of human intimacy. Intimacy is another word uh, for closeness and connection. Uh, uh, that uh, That is more than just a superficial. Intimacy is distinctly human, our capacity for, uh, for this kind of attachment intimacy. And so this is uh, uh, one more thought here before we go on. Uh, because a sex is all about attachment. A sex is about a way of contact, a way of connectedness, a way of touch. Also about a certain aspect of exclusiveness in attachment. Uh, that it makes sense that sex comes into the story as well. I have a course on adolescence and sexuality which, which unfolds this material. Uh, but it turns out when the pieces are put together that the capacity for relationship continues to develop before becoming sexualized at puberty. So ideally, all six ways of attaching should be introduced. Uh, by uh, seven years of age, uh, it begins, it be, develops to mature the capacity for relationship. And then if we were in an ideal world, uh, this would become sexualized at puberty. Unfortunately, now children are sexualized long before puberty, and that plays havoc uh, with this. But, uh, but if, if they were sexualized at puberty, especially the peer orientations, not uh, the hierarchical or. Uh, 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 attachments, then, uh, or the peer attachments, not the hierarchical attachments. This is in preparation for pairing and parenting, uh, which in studies of, of now uh, sexual intimacy, we realize that the two go together, that sex is like, uh, 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 like a, a, a super glue, human super glue that we're discovering, a bonding together, uh, whether one is ready to or not. And uh, so it is best to be in the context already of relationship uh, where it makes sense. Uh, so when sexuality is there for a reflection of how developed one is in the capacity for relationship, as if that capacity for relationship is never developed, one has never developed the capacity for human intimacy is still about, as we'll look at, being, uh, being with and being like. Uh, if it's superficial, the su sexuality will be equally as superficial. Uh, one cannot be more sexually developed than one is developed through attachment. So this precedes it. If you want good sexual development in an adolescent, you, they are, there needs to be good development of attachment. Uh, as a child, it, it goes together. 
Now, I chose a plant analogy to put this together. Uh, when you have a model, you always have to have an analogy. What is the analogy? With my aggression material, I looked for an analogy. Uh, you know, uh, most people were using the volcano analogy, but it only said so much, and that was only one outcome. And so I ultimately ended up with a traffic circle, a roundabout analogy, because the most, most important thing Thing about our primal emotions is there's alternate outcomes and so when I was looking around for this what has what has multiple attachments what can attach in different ways what can attach and all of a sudden it came together the plant the plant the many many plants have multiple roots most plants have multiple roots and then it just unfolded not only was there multiple roots, but the roots are hidden from view. This is exactly the way it is in humans. Is They're hidden from view. We don't have a language about this. We've not developed anything, a consciousness around this. We see the, the result of maturation. We see on top of the soil, but we don't see beneath the soil. Uh, we see the, the fruit of attachment, but not the roots from which all of the maturation happens. And like plants, humans can't be too attached. This became a dreadful myth that developed in the early years of individuation theory, where people were trained in this idea uh, that, uh, that you could be too attached, and therefore attachment was the enemy of maturation, and you must separate in order to grow up. And so attachment became negatively perceived as enmeshment, as fusion, uh, as it was used in pejorative terms, uh, instead of as it as as it is, you, a plant could never be too attached. The deeper attached, the better it is. Uh, it can be too superficially attached. Absolutely, the three-year-old who can't separate from mom at preschool or daycare may be too superficially attached. The answer for that is not less attachment. The answer for that is deeper attachment, the ability to hold on when apart. That is always the answer, uh, is the ability to hold on when apart or too insecurely attached. A storm, an emotional storm for humans, uh, can tear us apart, disrupt the behavior. All kinds of things can come in the way. The idea is to have an attachment that's so deep nothing can come in between. You can go hold you can hold on through stormy weather, uh, and that is the whole idea. The relationship of attachment and survival. Uh, for a plant, there is no survival outside of attachment. If its roots are disrupted, if it's pulled out by its roots, if it loses its rootedness, if any part of the plant becomes disconnected from any other the, uh, part of the plant, it's death. And that is analogous also, in a sense, to humans at another level as well. It's very interesting that for all creatures of emotion, creatures of emotion, all mammals, they do not have survival instincts. That is a phenomenal realization. They do not have uh, uh, survival instincts. Uh, because the emotional brain is meant to serve survival through attachment. In other words, in other words, your probability of survival increases with closeness and contact to those to whom you are attached. So when there's a catastrophe, an earthquake, when there is stress, what happens is 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 children, adults, whoever, is not looking, where's the water, where's the food, where's mommy, where's daddy? Everything has to do with proximity. And that explains all kinds of things, including the possibility of suicide and many other things, is that humans, that attachment has replaced survival. And so like plants, we need to attach. When under stress, we uh, that that drive to hold on is bigger than ever, but this absolutely transforms one's way of thinking. Let me move on here. Uh, deeper roots require conditions that are conducive. I try to get a diagram here where the soil gets more dense as it goes uh, deeper. Uh, deeper roots require permeability. Uh, for a plant to get deeper, uh, where I live, uh, we have a very uh, 
a hard pan that's closest to the surface and I always know when my when my plants get through that hard pan in fact our house a very old house a hundred years old at least by North American standards old as sits on this hard pan hard pan it's a superficial not a, a deep foundation but when the roots crack through all of a sudden you can see they gain this nurturance they never never dry out uh, uh, drought doesn't affect them it's amazing uh, but uh, these uh, these deeper roots to be able to get there for humans require conditions that are very conducive and then as I mentioned there's a relationship between attachment and maturation there's no fruitfulness in a plant without fulfilling attachments there's nothing that happens on top of the soil unless there is something equally happening underneath the soil what you see on top is simply a picture of what's happening below and that is the story and again this confronts the idea that one needed to separate in order to grow up no not even adolescents in fact when adolescents separate they get stuck at levels of attachment no they don't need to separate to grow up they need to become so deeply attached that their own individuation does not threaten that attachment the deeper the attachment the better off they they are uh, this is uh, it, it, a maturation is rooted in attachment uh, that that uh, that explains it and so uh, again so important early theories of individuation got this wrong and it's so important to understand this again is is the answer is in deeper attachment attachment that is not so disrupted by individuality by not being with not being like uh, by not agreeing with this is what is required as soon as there is danger to this all the energy for maturation stops and so again uh, and where did, when does maturation happen just like plants when roots find what they are seeking for it's not just a matter of the roots themselves they're looking for something and they're seeking, seeking for contact, closeness, proximity, uh, seeking for love, to be known, for belonging, for significance. It's when they find what they are seeking and when it feels as if there's more than they need, when they can take it for granted, there is rest and that nurturance comes through. And that's exactly what the story is. When plants find what they are seeking, maturation, fruitfulness happens. And the deeper the roots, render the uh, uh, the less dependent upon shallow roots the beauty of the deep roots is that those you know we have as, when windstorms come I live next to a ravine and there's uh, there's some fir trees and and cedar trees that are over a hundred feet tall and uh, their roots go deep they are secure uh, you know the shallow roots may give way with uh, with storms but the deep roots will and increase their ability as I said to find nurturance and so the plant analogy seemed to be the fit for this uh, and that's why I developed it what I uh, decided upon here for my teaching diagram was a simple diagram uh, the attachment roots under the ground what you see is the possibility for maturation on top uh, springing forth uh, from the roots, the idea of the vectors, the arrows, the springing forth, the potential. The black were the ones we share with all other mammals uh, and uh, uh, creatures of, of attachment. Uh, these are robust, they are strong. Uh, you will see these, uh, these, these are the more superficial ways of attaching. Uh, the more common, the gray are the more optional ones, uh, the more distinctly human ones, require optimal conditions, require conducive soil, uh, require an invitation to exist. And uh, so six all different levels. And so I try to capture the level and the sequential nature of this. And so this is, uh, this is the analogy that I ended uh, uh, up with. And uh, so again, we'll uh, we'll start with our story on this. Uh, we will go through each one and talk about it a little bit. Uh, again, each one only takes its meaning from the larger picture. And so, uh, for instance, uh, in, in classic attachment theory that we often speak to, uh, it was all about the drive to be with. But that takes its meaning from the larger context of maturation 
of, of uh, the development of the capacity for relationship and so on. So there's a big picture here. And so I've, I've kept this as the background and for you to appreciate that remember, when we put a piece of the puzzle here, don't forget the big picture. This is the big picture. If you don't forget the big picture, you'll begin to see it in the, the, the role that it plays in the larger scheme of things. Uh, but we all start. We all start. And the start is the drive to be with those attached to. Humans are born uh, with many instincts, reflexes, attachment reflexes. This, oops, here. This one is an attachment reflex. This is an attachment. This is back an attachment reflex. Tracking with the eyes. Uh, there, uh, there are all kinds of attachment uh, reflexes we share uh, with uh, with primates, uh, uh, many with other uh, animals. It's all about the senses. It's all about being with, in sight, in smell, in hearing, in touch. Uh, in touch becomes an analogy, a metaphor. As I understand in the Russian language, and touch is huge. It actually encompasses all of the others. So every language has its own nuances around this. Uh, for, uh, for in English, sight uh, seems to be the most important one. That, I mean, in terms of our language that we've developed. Uh, uh, but uh, smell is usually the one that's not talked about. It is so significant. Uh, to be in smell, uh, not only for other creatures, but uh, for humans as well. But it's a drive to be with. Uh, this, this, the, uh, this is always at the base of our attachments. Uh, this desire to be with those attached to. Uh, and it serves so many functions, but it's the beginning. That's what one must remember. It's the beginning. It's only the beginning. Now, we could spend a whole university course, a whole undergraduate program, a graduate program on this alone, and we would never run out. I just want to appreciate you to appreciate how big this piece is. It is huge. The danger of it is thinking that the piece is all of it. It isn't all of it. It's a piece of it. And so what I'm trying to do is give you the big picture here. Uh, but there are many theories about this, many theories that have been written on this. Well, what does it do? Why do children need to attach? What is so important about them? Why is it the preeminent need? Well, first of all, we all need to feel at home. We all need a home base. If we don't have it, we never stop looking for it. We never stop looking for it. We need a home we need a home base. That's not a house. It's a place of attachment. We need a place where we can rest, a resting place. Humans require rest. Absolutely. It's essential. If we don't have sleep, our brains start to become dysfunctional. Nothing works. Rest is incredibly important every which way. And this is a way of psychological rest. We need a resting place. As humans, we couldn't possibly live in this world without a bubble of safety. When a child is close to those that they're attached to, they feel safe even in the middle of a war. That is huge. It's the bubble of safety that they're granted. Otherwise, none of us could function. None of us could function in this wounding world without this bubble of safety. And if children are not attached in the right way to the right people, they don't have this bubble of safety. And that means emotionally they have to become armored when they lose this bubble of safety. And that's the problem I talk about in my book, Pure Orientation. When they lose this bubble of safety, oh my goodness, it's an emotional catastrophe. And a compass point to get their bearings. One of the most important things for us is not to be lost to get our bearings, to have a sense of ourselves in this world of who we are. When we don't have attached, remember those days, maybe the first days of school when you didn't know anybody there and how lost you feel? And only when an attachment forms do you no longer feel lost. Now, the person you attach to may be lost, in fact, themselves. But the fact is, is that it's a compass point to get your bearings. 
And so uh, when you're unable to get your bearings, something has happened in attachments. And so this tells us about the very, very basic things. When, when people are no longer able to get their bearings, the first place we should look at is the story of attachment because this is a compass point to get your bearings. It enables us to take care of them. We can't even take care of pets who don't want to be with us. It enables us to take care of them. It enables us to keep them close. And it commands their attention. The number one priority of all attention is to attend to those that we're attached to. If our children are not attached to us, if our babies are not attached to us, if our adolescents are not attached to us, they won't be attending to us. They won't listen to us. Uh, we will not be able to command their attention. That's par part of the problem with step parenting, with foster parenting, uh, when they don't want to be with us. How in the world do we get their attention? And it and allows us to free them to venture forth. This is huge. This is huge because if we provide a home base, then nature can get on with the job of becoming their own persons to venture forth in their world, to become curious about the things they're not attached to. But to become curious about this world, to attend to other things depends upon them being able to have a home base. This is the beautiful metaphor uh, that uh, that uh, John Bowlby, the father of the word attachment, spoke to, uh, is, is this beautiful relationship between attachment and maturation, is that when home base is secure, when you can take it for granted, when you can get a sense of it, uh, then the energy turns to venturing forth. Uh, and so the answer to maturation is rootedness. And so we could go on and on. As I say, we, uh, we, we could, uh, I, I could talk about this all year and we wouldn't run out. Uh, the primary challenge here is to provide a sense of undisrupted connection until able to hold on to us by other means. If we really understood this, we would understand that the story of attachment is a story about being able to hold on. It's about being able to hold on when apart. And so for us, as humans, the big question is, how do we hold on when we can't be with? And the importance of, in those early years, and the importance of, the, of, of infancy is providing a sense of continuity. This is the biggest issue in bedtime. The biggest issue in bedtime is, how do you provide a sense of continuity? Uh, when, when, uh, how do you provide a child to be in sight and smell and hearing and touch? Well, if you can't do in sight, can you do in smell? Can you wrap the baby with some of your own clothes so they can stay in smell? If not in smell and hearing, uh, are these our ways? Now, uh, there's no one right answer. There's all kinds of answers. But the issue is, can we provide a sense of continuity? Because powerful emotions are evoked powerful emotions. Emotions, remember, are charged, are commissioned. They have work to do. And the emotions, the work of emotions is the primary job of emotions, the primal separation emotions, is, is to preserve closeness and contact because that serves survival. So when we are unable to provide a sense of continuity here, the child becomes alarmed, and then all the outward manifestations of it, anxiety, agitation, restlessness. The child becomes frustrated. And so there's uh, the early head banging with temper tantrums and so on. And the child becomes highly seeking. These are powerful emotions that are trying to fix the problem. And the problem is the separation problem. Uh, there's no question about this anymore. Neuroscience has already uncovered these primal separation emotions, and that emotion serves attachment first and foremost. So, so this is the job. Is, is we, we need to help our children preserve that sense of closeness when apart. Uh, and if they're attached, I've had 12-year-olds who are still attached primarily through the senses. That's where we need to start. How do we preserve a sense of contact and closeness until able to hold on to us by other means? And But there are other means, and that is the good news here. By, this, by uh, close to the first uh, birthday, by 10, 11 months of age, you should see, if everything is going well, a very strong drive to be like those attached to, to imitate, to emulate, to conform to, to take on the form of, to model after, to identify with. These are, are huge. The identification you can't see, that's happening on the inside. But the other ones you should be able to see 
It is huge, this force, and it is all about another way of being attached when you can't be with. And so it, it, uh, it corresponds to when a child starts walking on his own two legs. Uh, somewhere between 11 months of age and, and, uh, and the 13 months of age is, is absolutely parallel to this. You should see this huge quest to be like. And this plays a huge part in their development. Uh, this is highly significant. Now, it enables them to hold us close when apart. That should reduce the alarm, the frustration when they're able to be the same. They can still be like us when apart. Now we know that this is the secret to language acquisition. That is the secret for all mammals. We talk like those to whom we're attached. We imitate the sounds of those we are attached. If we understood this, this would revolutionize our school system, which is basically about teaching language. But we talk like, make the sounds like those to whom we are most attached to. That is the key. If the parrot attaches to you, they make sounds like you. That is the very key. Not teaching, not formal language education. It's the same thing with learning a formal language. What is the trick? Fall in love with somebody who speaks that language. You'll learn it faster than any other possible way. If you're already in love, I wouldn't suggest this as a solution to it. I want to learn this language. Uh, but nevertheless, you see the point. The point is, is, is language was, is all part of this emulation, imitation, making of the sounds like. Uh, it forms our core identity to identify with is to be the same as. So one identifies with roles, with characteristics. I am, you know, are, are characteristics of how I'm like. This is the same because what is the, the what is happening here, what needs to develop is the ability to stay same, the same across time. So when I wake up in the morning, I have a sense of sameness, a sense of continuity. So one's identity is formed through attachment. It's all about attachment. It's a story of attachment. This is a huge area of literature, identity formation. How does it form? It is all about, including gender identity, all of these things, all of these are issues of attachment. It is about this quest for sameness and how it develops. Um, and, uh, and so we talk like, walk like, take on the demeanor. That's why with, with children with classic autism, when they have great difficulty in attaching for whatever reason, uh, sensory being uh, most uh, likely reason is sensory overload, uh, but it's causing defensiveness and attachment. And when they do not develop this ability to, to emulate, when they do not develop this attachment, uh, they don't acquire language, they don't acquire our demeanor, they don't walk like us, talk like us, dress like us, and so on. And so this is our key uh, for fitting into society. Nature has a plan. It all unfolds, but it unfolds attachment. If attachment, if they're properly attached to us, in right attachment to us, nature uh, attachment will do the work. It will do the work. It will all be there. Our job, is to make sure that children are in right relationship for us. The rest will unfold. It enables us to stamp our form on them, to get them to eat our food. This is so significant for all creatures, mammals of attachment. We eat like those to whom we are attached. We we have this now. I have uh, one, one of my six grandchildren is, is just at this age. And uh, so it's a bit challenging to, to uh, Ethan, it's a bit challenging to, uh, uh, to feed. And, and so uh, my wife uh, often says, uh, you know, uh, Papa, you need to come here. And then gives one spoon to me, and then a one spoon to Ethan. Of course, if Ethan wants, is very attached to me, he wants to walk like me. He takes these glasses and he puts them on and he walks with me. You know, he makes the sounds. I call the crows and the ravens near our house and he calls them, you know, ah! 
he calls them and all of this. He's, he's, he's uh, imitating my sounds. And, of course, he eats what I eat. I put them on my lap. I take a bite, and then he takes a bite. That's the way they were meant. This whole idea of baby food, this whole idea uh, that they eat differently than us, uh, that created so many eating problems. They are meant to eat the same as us. To get them to eat our food is to do so in the context of relationship. Uh, all of this. To pass on our culture and our values. These are stories of attachment. This is how we do this. This is how it is. But they must want to be like us. The problem is, is that we are, we have lost our way in this. We think by this that they need to be with those they are like. So we think they need to be with each other. No, no, oh my goodness. If they are like with each other, they'll talk like each other, walk like each other, act like each other, eat each other's food, fast food, whatever it is. No, they're meant to be like us. They're meant to want to be like us. But we need to hold on to them. We need to preserve those relationships. If we don't, we're going to have problems. And that is we become a peer-oriented society where already two-year-olds are expected, you know, put with each other to expect, now you need to be like each other, that this is the answer to socialization. You can see the problem here. Our primary challenge then is to preserve our role as their models for as long as they are, they need us. And in this day and age, that goes into the early 20s. Uh, childhood is, is the longest ever. It used to only last, you know, 13, 14 years of age, a very quick adolescence, and they were adults, and now it goes on. And make it easy for them to identify with us. It hurts them to say, you know, you're not like me. You're not at all like me. They must have a sense of being like like me, to say to them, you're just like me, you're just like your papa. You see the two-year-old just burst uh, with wonderful attachment pride. Uh, this is often the starting point in other attachments as you start at this area. Well, let me move on. It That's, again, that's just part, one piece. It's just one piece. It's huge, but it's one piece. By close to the third year of life, you should see in their art that they're grouping things. They're putting things together. Who belongs to whom? Uh, they're having a sense of who is coupled, who, you know, the cousins, friends are. They're always putting together, always grouping. Uh, one thing is a part of a group, and that is now they're beginning to, to find themselves as a part of another. The drive to be part of. Now, in actual fact, these are two ways of attaching, but I couldn't see that they happened at a different time than each other, so I put them together. And that's why I said at the beginning, six or seven ways of attaching. Uh, maybe it's just our language in English. I couldn't find a way of a one word that had the same. So uh, belonging is to be part of another, a family or a group, uh, to belong to or possess a someone or something. Of course, we can attach to our belongings, uh, or we can get an acquisition complex where we're trying to get more belongings. Uh, these things, attachment is not just to, to, uh, uh, to those that are responsible for us, of course. And then our great danger is that we think that children belong with those that they are like. We're going reverse. We're going backwards in today's society. We think that they belong with those that they're like, and so they should be with those that they're like. Oh my goodness, they belong to us. All of human history, we belong to those who are responsible for us. Our children belong to us. If they do not belong to us, we will have great difficulty being able to uh, to. Uh, uh, to be able to bring them into their full potential. And then there's the same side. In this way, closeness is to be beside, on the side of, take the side of. This is huge. The belonging and loyalty, whole cultures revolve around these constructs. They are profound constructs. Uh, to, uh, to, to be on the, on the side of uh, this construct of loyalty, to stand up for, to perfect, to protect and defend, to be for rather than against. 
and words we don't use anymore, but are so important in this construct to serve and obey, to make things work for, to defer to. These are all aspects of these attachment instincts. Uh, these are, are so necessary. Uh, we, we, we have these, for instance, in Canadian law. Uh, we expect people to tell the truth in the court, except, except, if you are the wife or the husband, if you are attached by marriage, we expect you to stand up for and defend your loved one. Because belonging and loyalty, even without knowing it, trump everything else. This is core, and it, it needs to be core, absolutely. And so uh, this... Uh, it renders them more able to hold on when apart from us. They are part of us. And, you know, at this age, uh, uh, my wife Joy with our grandchildren is so good at this. There's my boy. There's my grandson. And they just, oh, they just eat it up. They want to be part of Nana, want to be part of the family, want to be part of the group. It answers this. They're able to hold on when apart because they don't live with us. So they need other ways of holding on. It enables them to feel close despite a growing sense of separateness, uniqueness, and differentness. You see, the thing is, as if when they start growing, when they start developing, if they find what they are seeking, and there is a sense of sameness, the first fruit of relationship is becoming different. What a dirty trick. They just get to feel the same, and they grow into becoming different. So now are they how, how are they to hold on? Well, now they need to be part of. Now they be, need to be on the same side. That is how to hold on. You see, if they don't go to this, it's going to be very difficult. Now they're going to be threatened by any difference. Now they are set to really push against our attachments. It has to go deeper. It has to contain all, all of, of, of their individuality. Uh, so they're able to feel close despite a growing sense of separateness, uniqueness, and differentness, more agreeable in general, less threatened by differences. How many adults are still threatened by differences? We see this huge movement in our society at the fundamental of attachment of people absolutely abhorred by differences. This is indicative in our society of, of adults who are not attached at a deeper level. They are attached at a superficial level. Uh, and they're more agreeable in general. And boy, that's so handy. And they are predisposed to be good for us. The most important motivation that enables us to parent. This is what is important. We were never meant to parent children, to teach children who didn't have an inclination to be good for us. It's not about behavior and consequences. It's about this inner drive of attachment. This is what equips us with a natural power to parent, to teach. When, when children attach to us at this level, it melts their natural counter will, their instincts to resist and coerce. This protects them against influence from outside of attachments. It's melted when they feel part of us, when they belong to us, when, when they are at, when we are on the same side. It allows us to impose some order on their behavior, which is the root word of discipline. That's exactly, uh, you know, it allows us to do so. Why? Because we can count on their desire to be good for us. Actually, that's all we need. We don't need any tricks. We don't need any trinkets. We don't need to re reach out for other things that they're attached to and use it against them. You know, what does my, my child care about? And then I use it against them. You see, well, we don't need to do this. If they're attached to us in a proper way, we have what we need. Attachment has the answer. Attachment is the answer. There's always the answer. It diffuses inherent shyness when in our company because very, very part of our attachment nature is it doesn't feel right to interact, to smile at, uh, to agree with, uh, to those we're not attached to. All shyness means in, in its original form is reserved for one's people. One's people. What does that mean? That's belonging. That's belonging. Reserved for one's people. When I belong to, 
I, whoever I belong to, I am not shy with. So shyness is crippling the school system. Shyness, counter will, is crippling the school system. Why? Because students are not attached to their teachers. When they're not attached, then it doesn't diffuse those instincts. We have all kinds of problems. It's a matter of attachment. Our challenges then are to find our way to their side. All through my courses goes the construct of to come alongside. To come alongside. Find your way to your child's side, if necessary, without taking sides, but find a way to their side. Make it easy for them to be part of you. Stay their answer to these attachment needs throughout childhood. They belong with those who are responsible for them, not with those that, that they are like in the sense of their peers uh, or necessarily that they are with the most in today's society. Let me go on. Our, I see our time moving on, and I need to move on quickly. The drive to matter to those attached to. We hold close that which we hold dear. So if we feel dear to someone... We feel close to them. We feel connected. Uh, this is huge, the quest for value, to be important, to count, to be regarded, to have respect, to be special, to be wanted, to be useful, to have stature, to be admired, to be cherished, to be precious, to be dear, to be esteemed. It's a huge dynamic. The vulnerability involved in wanting to matter can hurt a child to the quick because now they become sensitive to signs of not mattering. One of the brain's defenses against it is to reach to more superficial ways of attaching. So now the child goes back to wanting to be the same as. Uh, and so this is huge, especially in pure orientation. Or another way of defense is depersonalization, to take the person out of the equation. And so instead of trying to win the approval of, a child becomes preoccupied with just winning, period. Now he becomes addicted to video games, addicted to anything about winning. He must win. He must be first. He must place. Uh, but where's the person in the equation? This is depersonalized. Uh, or status, or, or esteem, or recognition. Oh, there's all kinds of ways. Reward, as uh, B.F. Skinner even said, is just simply an element of worth, a worth nugget. And that's what a reward is, is a sense that some, you know, somebody has valued something. And so these are depersonalized things. There is no fulfillment, no fulfillment in depersonalized. You could play a video game, forever and ever, when every time there is no fulfillment, no release, you're never getting what you're looking for. No matter how much you win, because it has to be answered in a personal relationship, in an attachment. And that that is it. What does this do? It renders them more able to hold on when apart, when they're different, uh, when, uh, when, when we're not always at their side, able to feel close despite differences and disagreements. That's big. Able to feel close even when unable to possess. That's huge because often in that possessive stage, they want it, they're they very exclusive. And this is the answer. But to matter to you, then they don't have to possess you. Uh, predisposed to measure up to your values. That's an important motivation. It enables us to, and this is huge, free them from becoming enslaved to a lifelong search for value and significance. This is how Skinner viewed us. In his book, Beyond Dignity and Freedom, there was no freedom and dignity. Carl Rogers said, yes, there is. Unconditional regard. You have to give it as a gift. In this, when putting the pieces together, it becomes so obvious that our job is to be able to give the sense of significance, of value, of importance, of matter, that nothing could come in between. It is our gift to them. When we do so, it frees them from becoming enslaved through a lifelong search for this. It prepares the way for the next phase of attachment so they don't go backwards into more superficial, but go forward into, into the levels of intimacy, which are the further levels. It opens a door to actualizing their full human potential. But that's the, that's the beautiful... Uh, 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 Maslow discovered this is that until until this this until you your need to matter to be significant is secure is fulfilled uh, the rest doesn't unfold uh, to actualize one's full potential so this allows us to do this our primary challenges then are to remain their answer so as to keep them from looking elsewhere 
The answer is not their peers. When you're looking for significance from your peers, you become enslaved no matter how popular you are. How popular you are, uh, you become incredibly insecure because it's subject to cancellation with every mistake. And this includes today's very popular depersonalized pursuits, digital pursuits, and fragmented fixations. We are meant to be the answer. They won't feed at our table unless the food is there. But we need to hold on to them, which is the whole, again, theme of the book. Now we go to the deepest levels of human intimacy. And these are the levels of intimacy. I had great difficulty labeling this. I wanted to get love in here someplace. It's a four-letter word uh, to uh, scientists because it can't be defined. Uh, we, we're scared of the word, uh, but yet I had to honor it because we all know that love makes the world go round. And so I try to get the main themes. I've called it love in this diagram. Sometimes when I teach, I call it emotional intimacy, which is the technical term for it or the scientific term. Uh, or we could say attaching at the heart because it involves the heart. Uh, it, uh, it, that's how children understand it. They start drawing the heart and so on. Uh, it involves what I call the limbic system. That's the emotional brain pulling out all the stops. In other words, it's going to go now. The limbic system is always in charge of the, uh, of the development of attachment, the emotional brain, that is. It is always in charge. But now, if the conditions are conducive, if it hasn't gone back to belonging and loyalty and senses, like significance is kind of like the watershed. Is a child getting hurt? Do they not matter? Are they wounded in their senses? And being important. Do they go backwards into more superficial, the more superficial, or do they have that beautiful sense that I matter, I'm significant to mom and dad, uh, that is there, can I matter? Then I can f go forward into love. Um, now, as I said, the child will begin drawing hearts and, uh, and the prerequisite though is you've got to be able to feel you have to. You can't give your heart away unless you can feel your emotions, uh, unless you have a soft heart. And that's what we mean by feeling your emotions. You can feel your missing. You can feel your delight. You can feel the embarrassment. You can feel alone. You can feel the whole when somebody you, you love is not there. All of these things, these tender emotions, when you can do so, you can feel full. Now you can give your heart away. And it's first evidenced by a child giving his heart to those to whom he is attached. It's a beautiful thing, absolutely a beautiful thing. Freud got it all so wrong. Uh, he did not understand this attachment, and, and he had already uh, got distracted by sex uh, by this time in his theory. It started off with a theory of emotional defense and, uh, and then became a theory of sexual development. And so he thought that uh, children basically fell in love with their parents so that uh, they, they wanted to sleep with them, in other words, have sex with them. And he called it the Oedipal and Electra complex. And what he didn't understand is, no, this wasn't it. It doesn't mean that your child won't want to marry you. It doesn't mean, but what are they wanting? What they want to do is what attaching at the heart gives you. When you attach at the heart, you're wanting to make a forever relationship. You know, you know, I want to hold on to you forever. Will you hold on to me forever? When, you're, when your five-year-old proposes marriage to you, don't say to them, I'm already married, sorry, you're too late. Uh, that's going to cause some great, great alarm and frustration. The answer is so simple. Don't you worry, honey. I will hold on to you forever. You are mine forever. That's all that is required. It is a forever kind of relationship. The problem is, is when you attach at the heart, and again, it's optimal. Not all children attach at the heart. This is, uh, this is, it is optional, I mean. Uh, if it's uh, too dangerous, too wounding, the child goes out of there and goes into more superficial attachments. Because when you give your heart away, you risk it being bro uh, broken. That's why it's usually safest in the context of family relationships. Sociologists tell us that family relationships are the only relationships in society that we experience as forever. That's the beauty of it. Now, we know this intuitively. If our five-year-old gets spooked, mommy, may something happen to you? Maybe auntie got sick and is in the hospital. 
hospital. Maybe a relative got killed in a car accident or grandma died. Mommy, may something happen to you? Uh, may you die? And so on. And the child is spooked, alarmed uh, because he's facing separation. You know, if you are intuitive at all, you know exactly the right answer. And the right answer is so simple. You know, don't you worry, honey. I'll always be your mother. What have you said? What have you said? We're in a forever relationship. Now, you don't answer that. I'll always be your mother, dead or alive. They're not quite ready to handle that part yet. That will be later. But the point is, is that this is where family, that's where this is meant to unfold in the context of family. This is where it's meant to be. We must hold on to them so we get their hearts and so that they can give us their hearts because this this is uh, you know this is where it's usually safe it's not always but usually and this drive for emotional intimacy as well as other advanced forms of attachment is greatly undermined by a premature digital intimacy see the, the problem with digital intimacy especially early in life about uh, about connecting with sms with text messages uh, uh, connecting through um, through email, all of this digital intimacy. The problem with that is that when it comes before nature has a sense to unfold the capacity for relationship, is it makes the capacity for relationship seem unnecessary because you found a way of holding on when apart. That's huge. And that's exactly what research is finding. The cost of early digital intimacy is children who do not develop a capacity for intimacy. And even in adulthood, when adults are preoccupied with digital intimacy, it takes them away from those that they have given their hearts to. Uh, there is a less appetite for emotional intimacy. This is the most important thing of all. It's, it's like when I talk about this, it's like cookies. There's a reason that we don't give cookies before the main course is because they have no appetite for dessert. If, if they, I mean, no, have no appetite for the main course if they're filled up with dessert. Uh, and this is this is so important. There is a season for digital intimacy, uh, but it's quite clear from development that before a child is giving his heart, it is not time for him uh, to to use it characteristically as a way of holding on to others when apart, because it will actually interfere with the unfolding at this level. Why do we need to have the hearts of our children? Let me just review briefly. To enable them to hold on to us when apart, through differences, disagreements, when not measuring up, when feeling the sting of our disapproval through emotional storms, this is the container. This is the womb. The womb is created out of this, of emotional intimacy. We were not, we were not meant to parent children whose hearts we did not have. At least by the age of five or six years of age, we need their hearts to reduce the impact of separation and the resulting emotional and behavioral problems. The fact is, is that what impacts us most emotionally is facing separation, huge alarm, huge frustration. And huge seeking emotions and again neuroscience has discovered these as primal separation emotions most of our behavioral problems aggression anxiety agitation uh, are all a result of these addictions and so on and so this becomes the answer to be able to hold on it reduces all of this it reduces the impact of separation attachment is the answer to keep from losing them to competing attachments if we're not attached at a deep level, when they're away from us, we stand being replaced by them. If they can't hold on to us when apart, they have to attach then to others. And so they attach to others to whom they're with or more like. This is our way of holding on to them when we send them to school. This is the long arm of attachment. We need their hearts. We need their hearts to develop the capacity for intimate adult relationships. If they don't develop it with us when they get married, they're not going to have that capacity. It doesn't mean it's not too late to develop it. But the fact is, is it's meant to develop with us as their parents, their grandparents. Then they develop the capacity, the taste for, they want true intimacy with their friendships. They self-select for ones they can, they can give their hearts to. It sets the stage for psychological intimacy. 
we, we shouldn't be having sex with those we have not given our heart to. There's many more things, but that's a basic. That's a basic. And so if we do not have that sense, we have no context for healthy sexual development and future sexual intimacy. And to shield them from wounding, to keep their hearts soft, which is critical for the unfolding of their human potential. This is, this is ironic. They need to have soft hearts to give us their hearts. But we need to have their hearts to keep their hearts soft. The number one way of keeping children safe in a wounding world is for children to have a strong emotional connection with a caring adult. There's, this is absolutely unequivocal. There's no controversy about this. Hundreds of studies all point to this, huge studies. This is the number one issue. And, and if we saw this in its context, we would understand that before we send them out into a wounding world, there would be a sense of readiness. This gives a strong argument for waiting until a child has given us his heart to send them out into a world that is too wounding for him. It enables him to hold us on when apart. When you've given your a heart, you can hold on, uh, you know, for being apart uh, for quite some time. And, and as I said, when a child gives his heart to those he is attached, it enables that child, because he matters more, to shield him against the wounds, external wounds, the wounds of his peers, when teachers don't like him, the wounds that are going around, uh, uh, all of these wounds, he can sustain them. The problem today is that we're losing the hearts of our children. We need to win them back. We need to get the hearts of our children to protect their hearts uh, for emotional health, uh, for emotional uh, uh, well-being. To the last one, just in time, just in time. There's one more that if all goes well and conditions are conducive, they weren't particularly conducive for me in this case, but if conditions are conducive, it will occur to a child to share, to share all that is within his heart with those he has given his heart for. The drive for psychological intimacy, not being a secret and having no secrets that could divide, at least no shameful ones. Uh, this is if, if uh, when uh, children develop to this level, uh, they will uh, they will define a best friend by a friend is who you share your secrets to or with uh, or who you keep the secrets of. Uh, more common in girls because girls often are less defended than boys and so go to deeper attachments. This is one of the great challenges we have is with our boys to be able to, to help them go uh, to that, that deep level of attachment. Uh, this is so important. It's usually triggered by the alarming realization of having become a secret, an inevitable fruit of healthy development. If all goes well, you know, the three-year-old, when he calls grandma, thinks that grandma can see, you know, how, oh, oh, what are you doing? And the three-year-old points to something and thinks grandma can see that. It doesn't, he doesn't realize he's a secret. He doesn't realize he can keep secrets. By five years of age, you enter into your sixth year, and if everything is unfolded well, you realize you become a secret. It's an inevitable fruit. Uh, at first of all, it's it's quite a rush when you realize uh, that uh, mommy doesn't uh, what mommy doesn't know uh, will get you in trouble. Uh, but it burns a hole in you because you don't feel as close anymore, and so it's a recapitulation of being seen and heard, but now in a much deeper sense of being truly understood or known from inside out. And so we go back to the beginning, but in a much deeper way. It involves making known that which is typically hidden from view, but we must be volitionally involved. It's not the same as knowing about. Uh, you could know all about somebody. They could have written the intimate details of their life in a book. That doesn't mean that there's any psychological intimacy. It has nothing to do with knowing about, and it has nothing to do with being exposed. You could expose somebody's secret. Intimacy doesn't come from that. In fact, it's the ultimate rape. 
uh, in terms of this. There must be, we must be the ones who take our clothes off, who reveal our secrets. It's usually the safest and happens most naturally in the context of where one has already given one's heart. This is the context. This is where it should be. This is exactly where it should be. And it requires a soft heart and the developed ability to reflect reflect on thoughts, feelings, and impulses. This is beginning. This is beginning. It should happen when a child gets some mixed feelings about five, six years of age. That's when reflection begins. This is when this is all comes together in healthy development. Must not be defended against the natural bias to express oneself. If a child has become too defended, has lost their feelings at ten once, then there's no bias to talk about one's inner self to others. Uh, this is, and so uh, uh, this is, this is, uh, then this will, will not happen. And for the possibility of fulfillment, it must be volitional, one's choice, and within the context of a personal relationship. The biggest phenomena of our time, Facebook, is an aberration of this. To be known, to be known, to be seen, to be heard. To make postings about myself. There's no such thing as efficiency in this. It doesn't do it. It's a depersonalization, just like in winning and video games is a depersonalization. Pornography is a depersonalization of intimacy. This is a depersonalization. The only way it counts is when you share your own self with another. It is the choice to share it, to reveal to reveal oneself, it's the only way one becomes known. That is why all the research on Facebook is those who have a greater capacity for intimacy are less drawn to it. And those who are drawn to it don't find it. They become more lonely. I talk about some of the, that, that research in my book. Uh, it, it can't be answered there. There's no efficiency in this. Why? Our last point here, why we need our children to share their hearts with us. Why is this so important? Why is it so important? One is to resolve sneakiness, secrets and secrecy. All absolutely toxic to relationships as well as emotional health and, and well-being. This is, this is well known to be toxic in emotional health. Very simple reason, so that we have a sense of our child. Very hard to parent children who we don't have a sense of. It doesn't make an angel of them, but at least if you know the devil in them, you've got a better chance. You know, it's very important to be able to have that sense that uh, uh, they don't want to ha uh, hide, uh, have secrets that would divide. To cultivate the ultimate human capacity for togetherness, despite differences, losses, lacks, conflict, separation, and separateness. There is no more ultimate sense of closeness than feeling known. Somebody gets you. It's powerful. Absolutely powerful. But it belongs in a context of those we have given our hearts to, and we've given our hearts to those that we feel significant, important to, and those that we belong to. You see, this all belongs in a context, not out of context, and certainly not depersonalized. To resolve the polarization of shallow attachment, what is happening in our world is frightening. Going back to superficial ways of polarized attachment, who belongs to whom, uh, dividing the world into us and them, racism, prejudice, nationalism, no, the answer to globalization is deep attachments. It is attaching at a deeper level. That is what answers the shallow attachment. And you can't teach this. It has to be grown. To prepare the way and provide a proper context for future sexualization of attachment. That is so huge to get into sex relationships when it traps secrets that would divide. No, sexuality and intimacy are meant to go hand in hand. When, when sex traps secrets, we've got a problem. And so again, this, this provides a proper context to support becoming their own person. This is huge. You see, th this, is, this, this is incredible. When I saw this, the, the, 
it, it just absolutely chills down my spine, is the ultimate way of attaching is also the ultimate way of coming forth, of coming out, of becoming one's own person. Because I am declaring myself, sharing my innermost being, not having any secrets that would divide. And in this process of ultimately becoming my own person, I make possible the ultimate closeness. Now, it doesn't guarantee it. I may be rejected, but it makes possible. Our job as parents, of course, is to bring those things together. We have two invitations to our children. The invitation to exist in our presence and not to have anything come between that. And the second invitation is to be their own person. And parenting is bringing those two invitations together. This level of attachment brings both together beautifully. And it's the prime self-disclosure as a primary instrument for self-realizations throughout childhood. Self-disclosure is so huge. It is. It now becomes an instrument in adulthood of becoming your own persons. It becomes an instrument of realizing one's own potential. So this introduces it at that at that level. So, so and our time is is uh, just come to the end. Uh, quickly fit it all in. All of these, all huge way of attaching, all take their meaning from the larger picture. Now, there's probably no analogy that can fit all the characteristics. So many of the physical characteristics of polarization I cannot explain through this analogy. They're better explained through magnetism and gravity and other things like that. But at least these roots, the way of holding on when apart, creating the psychological womb for individuation, being able to create the deeper attachment to hold on emotional storms, the idea that one can never be too attached, uh, only too insecurely attached, too superficially attached, uh, the relationship between attachment and maturation, all of these unfold in this and much more. And also it reveals the danger of premature uh, digital intimacy. Intimacy, the digitalization of attachment is that it interferes with nature's own answer, which is a capacity for, for relationship. I hope that this has made sense of, uh, of some of the dynamics. I hope you can see yourself in the story of attachment, your children in the story of attachment, your friends, your spouses in this. I hope you can see the phenomena that's happening in this world in the story of attachment. Uh, and, of, of course, the most important implications of this of all is how to cultivate right relationships between children and their parents and, uh, and their teachers. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share with you uh, what I've had glimpses of the big picture, uh, to share with you the, this, uh, this perspective uh, that gives meaning to all the details within it.